The year was 1990. Fresh from the combined efforts of Chris Columbus and John Hughes, may the latter rest in peace, came one of the most well-known family comedy films slash franchises of all time. I'm of course talking about Home Alone, and that's no shit right there. The story revolved around an unintentionally left-behind 8-year-old kid, Kevin McAllister, portrayed by Macaulay Culkin, whose uncaring family takes off for Paris for their vacation. Eventually, our pint-sized hero adjusts to living solo, hence the aforementioned title, and in order to maintain the sanctity of both his house and his well-being, he confronts a pair of notorious wannabe burglars, the Wet Bandits, Harry Lime and Marv Merchants, portrayed by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, respectively. Kevin even finds his inner saints upon connecting with the ever-so-rumored family murderer, next-door neighbor Old Man Marley, portrayed by Robert Blossom, may he also rest in peace, who then becomes the avenging hero in the end. Thus, the Wet Bandits are detained and taken away to the Slammer, and Kevin and Marley reunite with their respective families, despite their sense of differences. Two years later, a sequel spawned, Lost in New York, in which it's the same frickin' routine, set the following year after the previous entry, except while Kevin attempts to have a perfect family vacation this time around, an unexpected shift occurs out of nowhere. While his family takes off for the Keys, in Florida to be precise, Kevin himself arrives in the Big Apple, and this is where the trivia comes in. Culkin was actually born and raised in Manhattan. It's also been a little over 30 years since he started acting, and some of his siblings, most notably Kieran and Quinn, the former who portrayed Fuller in both films, have been involved with his brother's upbringing in show business. With that aside, there in New York, after being released from prison, the Wet Bandits, here renamed the Sticky Bandits if you will, start way more shit than ever while Kevin adjusts to indie vacationing life in the big city at the Plaza Hotel, and is eventually fed up with it due to a series of twists and turns, hence the subtitle, obviously. Until he had another helping of inner sainthood is provided in the form of a local homeless pigeon lady, portrayed by Brenda Fricker, who was also in So I Married an Axe Murderer not long after. While both films garnered a hell ton of acclaim throughout the years, despite the latter gaining mixed to negative reception, the rest of the franchise spiraled into a chaotic downhill purgatory from which there was no chance of escape. A third film entry, released half a decade later, with Alex D. Lynch stealing Cook in Spotlight, considering he was past his teens at the time, which did way worse. And let's not get ourselves started with those atrocious ass two made for TV follow ups! Hell, the first two made their way into the game adaptation circuit, and those are where the focus of our latest review comes in. First things first, we're diving into the first three Home Alone games, based on the first film, all by THQ for the NES, developed by Bethesda, and even the Super NES and Game Boy, developed by Imagineering, all released 1991. You assume the control of Kevin upon starting, and basically you're supposed to stop the wet bandits in their path by using random home accessories, tools, toys, electronics, etc. Just like in the film, obviously. Buttons A and B are used to collect or possess, if you will, and set a trap respectively, while the select button cycles between the trap items you collect. Take note, you can only carry up to no more than three items. Eventually, I'll get to why the traps are about as useless as fucking Family Advice, 5-Hour Energy, Ritalin, and V8 combined, despite them being the only weapon Kevin uses. Should either of them get near you, it cuts to the infamous Oh No! Game Over-themed cutscene, and depending on which version you're playing, it either features that same message popping out of the chimney, or a bastardized rendition of Kevin blurting it out, followed by your progress screen, which can be accessed at any time by pausing, followed by the title screen. And speaking of the progress screen, you're provided with a map of the house, which only shows the traps you've used so far, and not the exact locations of either Kevin or the Wet Bandits. Like, what the hell, THQ and Bethesda? Complete with your overall score, and how much time you've got remaining before the fuzz arrive. In terms of time, by the way, you're given exactly 20 minutes to guard your lair from those jackasses. Every time either Harry and or Marv get near a trap, they're temporarily stunned, thus giving you a fighting opportunity to escape from them. But if I were you, I'd keep the absolute sharpest eye out for their awakening. Other than patrolling certain sections of the house, Kevin can even traverse his backyard treehouse via the wire from his bedroom window, minus the broken handlebars used as a zipline. In terms of attempting to traverse down and or up certain stairs, that's another story in and of itself. You have to use the diagonal directions of which flight of stairs that you're about to travel. And before I forget, yes, Kevin can moonwalk, obviously. 
as you can tell right away, the gameplay aspect becomes monotonous at a shockingly accelerative rate, and the controls are ruptured and half-assed beyond every means of testing. While there's no checkpoints or continues, or even a password or save feature, there really isn't much to offer in the way of challenge. Basically, it's either you sit on your ass attempting to win, or you wind up getting nabbed. Unbelievable as it is, Harry and Marth travel at approximately one quarter the speed of a bullet, in other words, faster than Kevin does, and the chances are as high as Mount Everest and Taipei 101 stack together that they'll outsmart your ass in more ways than you think. Even more aggravating is the earlier stated stair navigation. When you're in the most desperate need imaginable, it'll take maybe less than five seconds, if in a bit more time, to maneuver that little bastard. Simply put, those factors will haunt you for the rest of your natural-born life worse than both Tommy fucking Wiseau and Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs combined, no matter how often you play. As detailed as the in-game elements are, I wouldn't go so far as to expect anything on par with the likes of either Capcom, Konami, Tecmo, Taito, Irem, Jaleco, or hell, even Natsume. Despite the primary opposing characters looking exactly like they're supposed to, the out-of-place hues make both the trap items blend in very closely with the background, Hence, an unexpected test of wits and attrition as you're fulfilling your main goal. As for the stair perspective, it's less than appealing at best to say the absolute least. Seriously, I've seen a way better stair design in Adam's Family by Ocean than even this, and that was out the same goddamn year! For the overall music and sounds, composed by George Sanger and arranged by Julian Lefay, considering that none of the music is in any way related to the John Williams score, except maybe for the half-assed title theme. There's only five songs heard throughout the entire game, and believe me, I've heard way worse in my line of work, but this one takes the goddamn extra-large Triple Decker 4 Cheese Meat Lover Zaz. Despite them being rather lively and bold, especially the main house theme, which is somewhat reminiscent of Run Run Rudolph, in reality, those songs can drone over you for an entire fortnight, if hell in a shorter time. Man, I'd rather listen to Troll 2's Naked Land, Chariot of God, Fire in the Water, and even your Never Too Old four times over per song. And don't even get me started with the goddamn sound effects. As soft and maybe obvious as they are, there's actually very little of them. And with that, Riley Sky 100, you have the floor. Hello everyone, this is Riley Sky 100, and I'll be talking about the Super NES and Game Boy versions of Home Alone. While the basic plot remains the same, the concept has been altered for both versions. Following a brief introductory cutscene outlining the bandit's trademark intentions, you're introduced to a whole new gameplay aspect. A platformer, surprisingly, where your objective is to collect various valuables and drop them into the basement while keeping Harry and Marv and other robbers at bay. In order to complete a level, you have to drop a required number of items in the basement to obtain access down there, and with the backpack, you can only carry five items at a time. The controls are pretty sluggish, particularly with moving left and right, as well as the jumping, which makes precision jumping frustrating to pull off, not to mention staying clear of enemies all the same. Up makes Kevin enter doors, bureaus, boxes, cabinets, and reveal hidden objects while jumping, YB, and A makes Kevin pick between and or fire a certain weapon and jump, respectively. My problem with the controls, aside from the movement and jumping, is that when you first play this game, you wouldn't know where else to press up aside from the doors in a case where you're trying to go up a staircase and can't get on it until you find out that up does the work. Also, the shoulder buttons aren't used for any command as well as the X button. While the Game Boy controls are basic, it doesn't perform any better than the Super NES. For power-ups, you have to find and munch down on pizza slices, eight of them, or an entire box of pizza grants you an extra life. Cookies restore a portion of your life, and aftershave, should you come across any, for temporary invincibility. As for the weapons and traps, Kevin starts off with a pathetic as hell water pistol, only used to stun your enemies briefly, and advances to other powerful types, including a slingshot, good for only ten slightly powerful shots upon collecting each one. Hmm, Dennis the Menace much? Alongside with a baseball, and even a BB gun. Huh, a Christmas story much? The latter series of offensive methods, the traps that is, include your standard banana peel, and even random falling objects such as bowling balls, trophies, paint cans, irons, giant portions of bricks, and left behind articles used as floor obstacles like thumbtacks and toys. 
As for the aforestated enemies, aside from Harry and Marv, some include a mobster who will sneak in and snatch a valuable in record time if your wits aren't as sharp as attack, and miscellaneous thugs, not to mention rats, bats, tarantulas, and literally a ghost. Last time anyone checked, this game is supposed to be related to Christmas. I think he lost his way to Monster Party. Anyways, after dropping every last valuable item within the vault, it's time for one final step. Confronting the basement boss after dodging a huge pain in the taint onslaught of traps, animal enemies, and locking every valuable. Hell, each stage thereafter revolves around the same. Rack up valuables whose range depends on which stage you're in, and send every single collective array of them into the vault, munch on pizzas and cookies for life, out with the enemies, scour the basement and obliterate the boss, rinse, lather, repeat. Should you get hit three times, your ass is sent to the infamous Oh No screen, illustrated visually in terms of Kevin's trademark bathroom mirror reaction upon applying aftershave, accompanied by his trademark scream, and the same bastardized rendition applies to the Game Boy version, thus resulting in an instant life loss. Despite the breathtaking change both versions have, the gameplay aspect gets very repetitive at a more gradual rate in comparison to their NES sibling, and the controls are a trifle half-assed and out of whack, notwithstanding their negligible improvement. And take note, all three editions of the game were released in late 1991, around the same time as Act Razor, Super R-Type, Shatterhand, Vice Project Doom, Earth Defense Force, Metroid 2 Return of Samus, Battletoads, Fortified Zone, Wapum, and even Final Fantasy 2 aka 4 amongst others, and no matter how awesome those games are, parents and kids still chose this just because they thought the film was entertaining. Just because a film is wonderful, that doesn't necessarily translate to a good game. And believe me, there are more than an abundance of examples of such. Considering that both versions are only four stages long, except maybe for the Game Boy, there's very little to offer here in terms of difficulty, unless yet again, your instincts aren't sharp. Besides, the ending's not much to drool over either. It's just poorly rendered stills of the film. Kevin reuniting with his mom, and the wet bandits having their fumbled asses thrown and locked up in the old Who's Gal. Speaking of which... Speaking of indeed, Riley Sky, the graphics. And I'll take that from here, for sure. Despite the overall visual presentation being slightly improved, in reality they're just bland, drab, and leaving tons to be desired. While I'll admit Kevin does look a sight like his film counterpart, that is, in terms of the daytime scenes, and the same story applies with his arch nemeses. God only knows, however, what to make of those newly created extra enemies. And once again, don't even get us started with those second fucking great film stills. Back to you, Riley Sky. Composed by Mark Van Heck, and here's a shot of the canon, the title music is actually a well done if somehow uninviting rendition of the film's opening theme by John Williams, who's also credited in both versions, surprisingly. As for every other track, as vigorous as they attempt to be, in reality they're nothing more than a series of vexatious as hell downers after another, same situation with those ear rapey sound effects and repetitive, though inviting at first, sound bites of Kevin's usual quotes. On the upside, I do like the decent rendition of Chuck Berry's Run Run Rudolph. Notwithstanding THQ's efforts to recreate the exhilarating feel of the comedy film, in the presence of their undeniable truth, all three renditions just fail very, very miserably. No matter which version you play, there's little to no replay value and not much enjoyment to experience as opposed to the film itself, which is more than I can say for the next movie to video game adaptation, which neither the film nor game are remotely decent or funny. Speaking of the sequel, that wraps up this part. I agree wholeheartedly, Riley Sky. And if I were you, I wouldn't so much as waste your time and or hard earned Okani with either of them, like we did, at all. Moving on to exhibits D, E, and F respectively, Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, once again, all by THQ developed by Imagineering, except they're all for the NES, Super NES, and Game Boy, released the exact same year as the film. Once again, refer back to the overall plot description I've outlined on which these entries are based, cause there's no fucking way I'm reiterating it! Upon starting, we're treated to an introductory cutscene of Mr. Hector, the Plaza Hotel Concierge, portrayed by Tim Curry, the old Rocky Horror Picture Show transvestite. 
phoning the authorities about Kevin's fraudulent credit card crimes, followed by yet another random phone call with those wet, aka sticky, bandit douches, made towards some of their associates about yet another arrangement to have Kevin wipe the hell out. And well, it's the same slightly updated platformer horseshit as in the Super NES and Game Boy versions of the previous game. Yawn. And the same story applies for the other versions. Unlike the previous game, however, there's actually an itinerary for the following locales as depicted in the film, obviously, in all three versions. You've got the Plaza Hotel, Central Park, the semi-renovated townhouse of Kevin's Uncle Rob, a minor character seen in the first film during the Paris apartment scene decorating the Christmas tree, portrayed by Ray Toller, and finally, the epic as hell chase from the townhouse, past the streets of the Big Apple, to the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Your basic controls, depending on which version you're playing, are as follows. Your traditional D-pad moves Kevin around as always, while up makes him enter doors and calls for the elevator, which you can pull off in the Super NES version by pushing X, and down makes him duck and pulls off his best Pete Townsend power slide whilst running. In the NES and Game Boy versions, B and A are used to fire your weapon and jump respectively, while the same also applies in the Super NES version, the Y button isn't used until later. And finally, in the NES and Game Boy versions, you can use select to swap out your weapons, whereas in the NES version, aside from swapping your weapons, you can also display your status elements, your score, how many lives you've got remaining, life count, whereas in the Super NES version, you can swap out your weapons by using L and R. In terms of power-ups and various weapons, tactics, the whole nine inches, the usual pizza slices are back, except an extra life is gained upon finding and munching on six slices this time around, and or obtaining an entire pie. So are the cookies, which come in packs of four. If you obtain 20 of them, either loose or in five complete packs, a unit of power is replenished. There's also a bell for an improved offensive spin-jumping technique, a candy cane or the usual aftershave for temporary invincibility, whereas for the latter, considering how rare it is, provides you with an ultimate overhaul in terms of his basic physical abilities. Getting to Kevin's offensive approaches, the aforementioned Pete Townsend-inspired slide is his only physical offense, while he can use his tranquilizer dart gun for stunning, a necklace, like in the film, for making his enemies slip, and even two types of flying fist bazookas, one of which smashes the fuck out of a single enemy and is good for two shots, and the other of which does the exact same goddamn thing, except it deals with more than one enemy, and you can even run after the latter type fist to elevate the body count to a higher extent. Upon reaching Stage 3, you can actually make use of every indoor article as traps to outwit the usual primary pair of antagonists. As one could have possibly expected, while Harry and Marv make yet another return in later parts of the game aside from a few cutscenes, other enemies include an appropriate yet out-of-place lineup, including various hotel employees, Mr. Hector, his assistants, maids, clerks, kitchen staff, etc., and even its guests, including hard-nosed detectives. Seriously, who the hell is he supposed to be? The half-anorexic fuck-twat brother of Hercule Poirot? Living luggage, including suitcases and bags, and even equipment, some of which are hazards to avoid, which I'll get to momentarily. Outsiders, including thugs and punks that hide in the bushes, rats, bats, pigeons dropping twigs, with the obvious exception of the aforementioned homeless pigeon lady found in the sewers at the end of Stage 2. And I swear to God, if your senses aren't in check every minute, they'll leave your ass reeling in more ways than one like it's no one's goddamn business. Same story with the first and only boss other than the wet aka sticky bandits in the entire game, namely that fat-ass hotel chef. And don't even get me started with those far from commonplace hazards, including vacuums, which if you get near them, they'll suck your ass up, resulting in an instant death, pillows thrown by maids, rooms, kitchenware, folding trash can covers, I could go on all damn day or night. Challenge-wise, considering all the factors I've pointed out, like every great game out there, the shit gets progressively easy, but man does the intensity kick in. Although those previously mentioned power-ups are readily available for the taking, they're very far and few between, and depending on which version you're playing, you either get a once-in-a-gameplay-span-continue opportunity, or total jack shit, resulting in, yep, you guessed it. Graphically, once again, it depends on which version you're playing. Though the Super NES Edition is slightly better than its 8-bit counterparts in terms of presentation and appropriate animations by comparison, the latter of which could have used more work. Everything else, from the backgrounds, all the way to the various other characters, animation-wise, leaves way more than necessary to be desired. And for the last goddamn time, let's not get each other started with those second-rate digitized stills. Seriously, I could have orchestrated a better design attempt than what we're looking at, that is, if it were up to yours truly. 
for the music and sounds composed as usual by Imagineering Zone Mark Van Hack. A few tracks are rather recognizable, considering they are somewhat based on the John Williams score, especially the Plaza Hotel Stage 1 theme. Hell, if I had to pick a personal favorite, no sugarcoating intended, that is, in the case of all these three entries shown here, if at least one of them, it would definitely have to be the Wet and or Sticky Bandits theme in the cutscenes, but yet again, they eventually turn out to be a total fucking bore fest in comparison to the previous Home Alone games, as well as, yep, you guessed it, those abrasive as ball sound effects! As far as Home Alone 2's replayability, no matter which version you're playing, in between each playthrough, you'll be begging to tackle every later stage like your dear life depended on it, but then again, not so much. Other than that, please refer back to that same statement Riley Sky made about the Super NES and Game Boy versions of Home Alone. In fact, do yourself a favor and hold out for our combined upcoming final verdict after the next string of opinions made out by myself and another special guest yet to be featured. Last group of exhibits, Home Alone 1 and 2 both of the Genesis, while the former also has a Game Gear part. All by Sega, while the Genesis and Game Gear versions of Home Alone were both developed by Brian A. Rice Incorporated, with Al Baker and Associates joining them for the Game Gear part, the latter, Home Alone 2 on Genesis, was actually developed by Interactive Designs. Almost like the other Home Alone games that were previously discussed, this game and its Game Gear counterparts are way more faithful to the film than meets the eye. Upon starting, we're acquainted with an options menu where you can change your difficulty mode, beginner or expert, the latter of which are allowed more weapon parts, which I'll get to momentarily, and control configurations, and even test the songs out. Following that, we see Kevin in a top view perspective where you can control the speed and location of the sled within which he travels. You can actually travel around Kevin's turf, running over random snowmen to gather various items, including various traps, and custom weapon parts to snuff the hell out of the wet bandits, judging from their usual signature OK plumbing van. Your basic controls are as follows. As always, your D-pad moves Kevin around, both in his sled and on foot within a certain house. A, B, N, or C, depending on your personal preferences, same story with the Game Gear Edition and said case buttons 1 and 2, can be used to fire your weapon, bust out your tire for jumping capabilities, only available in the Genesis version, or just flat out perform a normal jump, not to mention accelerate your sled whilst outside. If I were you, I'd keep a close eye peeled on that charge meter. The more you accelerate your sled, the less likely it is to travel moderately. Upon entering a certain house, you can then set up your traps within any area of said house should the dim-witted, dastardly dickweed duo break in. After that process, we're treated to an all-new, if somewhat familiar, side-scrolling concept. Except Kevin has real weapons at his disposal this time around, the first of which is a BB gun, like in the film, again, which I'll also get to momentarily. As you're storming your desired house, and everyone thereafter, be sure to collect every other feasible weapon part and or valuable, if there are any, contained within, while avoiding unexpected hazards and distractions, including Buzz's pet tarantula, randomly formed cracks in the old house, if you walk in or jump accidentally anywhere, a quarrel with some poltergeist in the colonial house that'll zap yours and the wet bandit's asses if your wits aren't sharp enough, a stray cat in the country house, and even a rampaging housekeeper robot in the modern house. Upon the arrival of the wet bandits, and this is where the excitement elevates beyond belief, be sure to prevent those ass wipes from looting every safe within the house by capping their pretentious asses, hence the paint meter that goes up. This also happens every time Harry or Marv get affected by a certain hazard or trap. Okay, onto the weapons and traps. Aside from your traditional BB gun, you can actually assemble or take apart different types of ammo and platforms, and even operators, so if I were you, I'd pick the right ones very carefully. And take note of the possible combinations shown below. MacGyver, eat your heart out. And watch your ammo meter at all times, cause your current weapon will run out quicker than half the duration of, say, an episode of Twin Peaks. Also, take special notice of the brief delay that occurs whenever Kevin fires his weapon, unnerving as it is. It's rather helpful when it comes to getting the timing down past whenever either one of the two crooked cock knockers approach you. Same story with the collision detection when it comes to certain jumping and landing tactics. Getting to the traps and hazards, Kevin can usually place the following items on his desired house's blueprints every time he enters one. For example, he's got the blowtorches like in the film, which are only good for one use. Remember when Harry goes to the rear door, and all of a sudden one of them just starts automatically lighting right on top of his noggin? Not to mention thumbtacks, ice glaciers, grease, tar, and even random toys and marbles. Be forewarned, after setting them up, 
You have to avoid these as well while preparing for the arrival of Kevin's worst adversaries. Should you get nabbed at any time, they'll stick you on a picture hanger on the wall, thus leaving you in suspended yet temporary movement, at which point you can then weasel your way off. Also, should those douchebag wet bastards happen to loot every safe in your current house, it then gets flooded, hence their name, and are frozen in the Game Gear version's case. Thus, Kevin fails his mission, becoming prohibited to set foot in that house for the rest of the game. And if every other house on the turf meets that very same fate, hence the house's left indicator, it's an instant motherfucking game over. Therefore, I'd put in every goddamn ton of effort in immobilizing their asses at every turn and maxing out that pain meter, no matter how much or how long it takes, hence the provided ETA on the screen until the fuzz arrive. In the beginner and expert modes, you're timed with 20 minutes and 40 minutes respectively. As for the overall gameplay and control scheme, Sega and the combined efforts of Brian A. Rice and Al Baker and Associates really had their work cut out for them in making a simple, if sometimes flawed, concept, and doing its source material way more justice than those atrocious as balls THQ renditions for every Nintendo system, despite how monotonous the routine can get after a given period of time. Challenge-wise, once again, it depends on the difficulty mode you set at the beginning, so I suggest referring back to the aforementioned durations given for each mode. More than that, not only will the Wet Bandits have a randomized as hell root in Expert mode, in other words, your first house doesn't always have to be the mansion unlike in the beginner mode, most of the item placements for certain houses also meet the same fate. In other words, not only will the same snowman be lying around, certain items will be rearranged whenever you enter a different house. And yet again, you'll be experimenting with different weapon combinations in between each play, not only in the aforementioned Expert mode, but also in beginner, the latter of which are also allowed in Auto Assemble feature. In addition, the timing of Kevin's weapon firing, avoiding and fending off Harry and Marv at every turn, and even the jumping and landing tactics, as mentioned before, also add to the challenge, so I'd vary my strategies in between each play if I were you. Graphically, while the Game Gear version's visuals are simplistic and tasteful, yet atrocious, the Genesis version outdoes its handheld counterpart by two shakes of a cat's whisker, if not by much. The usual opposing characters look to some degree like their film counterparts. The backgrounds for certain houses and even the top few exteriors aren't something to be mocked at here. They definitely portray the joyous holiday theme that it presents, no matter what situation Kevin's in. And as flattering and whimsical as most of the animations are, including those of the Wet Bandits whenever they get immobilized at every turn, not to mention the addition of various traps and characters, they tend to lose their spark after quite some time. In terms of music and sound, Composed and orchestrated by Cliff Falls and Rolf Weber, each and every original track offered throughout each situation is nothing short of satisfying, even with its diverse array of themes for each appropriate house Kevin explores, no less. The sound effects, however, as appropriate and zany as they are, I have no other alternative but to look the other damn way. Other than that, Sega and the combined efforts of Brian A. Rice and Al Baker really went the extra mile in staying true to its source material, though the overall soundtrack isn't anything close to or remotely like the John Williams film score. The Game Gear version, however, is composed of nothing more than semi-bastardized renditions from its Genesis counterpart. And finally, for their replayability, thanks to the two aforementioned diverse difficulty modes and the respective sets of benefits and restrictions they have to offer, Home Alone for both the Genesis and Game Gear is definitely something you'll want to come back to more often than one could possibly expect, notwithstanding all the horseshit you'll endure throughout. I'd say, give both versions a lick or two. For the absolute last time, refer back to the plotline for the second film. Here, however, instead of starting off in the Plaza Hotel, the game opens up for us at the airport, where Kevin realizes the irony of his fate. Basically, we're back to dull-ass knock-off point A to point B platformer universe. There, we're treated to avoiding and or thwarting every distraction imaginable. Various passengers, security guards, baggage claim workers, city thugs, unsuspecting neighbors, and the like. And of course, as we'd expect, the wet, aka sticky, bandits. The rest of the itinerary here includes various New York City outskirts and exteriors, Duncan's toy chest, the usual Uncle Rob's townhouse and its inner sewage system, and finally Central Park leading up to the iconic Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, resulting in a unanimous total of eight stages. Your basic controls include using the D-pad to move Kevin around, as usual, and even duck or jump down from various obstacles in conjunction with said ability, Contra style, aim his desired weapon in conjunction with firing. 
A, B, and or C, which you can swap out of the option screen. Again, like most Genesis games, either makes Kevin jump, perform any special, especially pushing support items, and or activating any button or other environmental device, and or fire off his weapon. In the beginning default case, he's got a baseball and or a slingshot, or any later singular or homemade weapon, that is, if you've made any effort to collect its parts. Kevin's even got his trademark slide, performed simply as ever by pushing down on your D-pad while running, best used for avoiding certain enemies in the style of those horrendous second to third rate Nintendo THQ versions discussed earlier. Getting to the usual bread and butter power-ups, the holiday presents spread throughout various stages grant you extra points depending on the color. Various food items that restore Kevin's health, including milk cartons, water bottles, lunch boxes, and your usual zaws. Also, the turtle dove ornaments from the film, sold by Duncan, portrayed by Eddie Bracken, which are intended as symbols of friendship and love, grant him an extra life. As mentioned before, you have to collect various homemade weapon parts while roaming around in a certain level before reaching those goddamn sticky bandit fucks, just like the previous Sega Home Alone game, not to mention every other last one discussed previously. Should Kevin happen to get his ass handed to him way too much at any point, especially either while or before confronting them, not to mention every other goddamn unsuspecting enemy seen throughout, it's an instant fucking life loss. You only get either 3, 4, or 5 lives via the option screen, and a few limited continues. Should the continue countdown reach zero, it's an instant fucking game over, followed by a cutscene with Kevin being shipped away on a train while his longtime rivals are yapping their asses off about their long overdue success. Bottom line, don't even think about letting that shit happen, ever. Thought I was gonna forget about the commonplace traps and hazards? Guess the fuck again. In the airport stage, for instance, you can actually wipe out those security guard dickweeds by setting off a water puddle trap, and even fend off the wet bandits by not only using your homemade weapons, but also various traps in later stages, including, once again, like the film, the aforementioned Uncle Rob's townhouse stage. And don't even get me started with the baggage claim luggage and those obnoxious ass stray cats in the later stages. Control wise, though they tend to be derelict and off the market times, they're not way too goddamn convoluted to say the least, unlike those THQ abominations mentioned previously, and can take an eternity within another to get down pat. In terms of challenge, while it's obvious that Kevin will do his absolute damnedest to defend himself, he tends to get his ass handed to him more often than not, doing part to the player's attention span. For instance, the suitcases of the businessmen you wipe out are launched at you in a flash, which is why I suggest timing my evasion in advance. As a preposterous pain in the ass as this game can get, it's honestly not impossible, that is, versus the previous Sega Home Alone game. It's a trifle more forgiving in terms of outwitting certain enemies. Avoiding other hazards, however, is where true dedication and constant strategy recollection are massive pluses in my book. Although they're a bit more dull than last time despite how ambitious Sega and its new team of developers, specifically the preceding interactive designs, were attempting to be, the graphics are actually attractive as, say, your one true love, if in full honesty not by much. In addition to the usual primary opposing characters, most of the supporting and or opposing characters are much more true to life compared to its Nintendo renditions. Same story with the cutscenes. Additionally, as for the backgrounds, as repetitive and depth lacking as they might appear to be even at first glance, their light years far from dissatisfying and do quite a fascinating job at recreating the film. As far as music and sound, composed and orchestrated this time around by Paul Gadbois and Dave Delia, beginning with the title theme, reminiscent of Darling Love, The E Street Band, The Miami Horns, and Van Zant's All Alone on Christmas, heard during Kevin's Turing montage in the film, and also heard at the end of the game. The game's original soundtrack is nothing short of invigorating, though it can get caustic at certain times, my personal favorite being the airport slash game over theme. In addition, the sound effects, though unfitting, are definitely not something to be mocked at here, especially the voice sound bites of certain characters, including good old Kevin. And finally, for replayability, more often than not, you'll be diving back into this entry much more so than those second-rate Nintendo counterparts, mostly for the sake of memorizing almost every last area following Stage 2, that is, the airport's baggage claim area, aka what Kevin likes to call the land of lost luggage, to avoid having his little ass handed back to him countless times. My first impulse, in full honesty, was to give this game an honest pass, but once again, as merciful as I am, why not a potential fucking fighting chance instead? So, what's our final verdict on every Home Alone game discussed so far? With the exception of the Sega lineup, namely Home Alone for the Genesis and Game Gear, and maybe Home Alone 2 on Genesis, 
Every other version that we've discussed, namely the THQ renditions for the Nintendo systems, are nothing more than yet another series of excuses to cash in on the success of the first two films, despite their attempts to capture their overall themes, and are even more annoying and abysmal than both the mind-controlling SETI eels in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and the Bog of Eternal Stench in Labyrinth combined. In other words, those games are a disgrace to the pint-sized suburban and urban Raiders legacy. Seriously, they all make Beam Software's Bad Street Brawler look like Technosoft's Naketsu Oyako, though they do have their iconic and recognizable moments. Their combined, overall commonplace and unfathomable elements in every department and tedious monotony far outweigh the fuck out of whatever virtues those aforementioned versions might have had. As for the Sega Home Alone games, in spite of the dilemmas that they harbor, which I'm in no position to reiterate, they're definitely the better group of games that excel in every common department, especially the second Home Alone game. Bottom line, you're better off with the Sega versions. I highly recommend them more than ever, for sure. But whatever you do, avoid the Nintendo versions like Hurricane Katrina, Snowstorm Juno, Global Warming, and Mudslides combined. Now before I go, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank Riley Sky 100 for this unforgettable collaboration. I'm Riley Sky. Until next time, see you all later. Until then, you filthy animals. This is the Hardcore Retro God signing off.